All right, Annie. May 10th, 2004, you defeat Ronald Graham in the two. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. 2000 like, Omaha. What's that day? 2000 Omaha High Low, eight or better, to win your first bracelet. Yep. Now, you played your first World Series in 1994. Right. So 10 years after that. Yeah, I know. It took my brother 13. That's the only thing that I take away from that. So competitive. No. <laughs> How sweet was it? I love Bob. Um, no, it was really good because I was... Uh, um, I, I had come in like I had come in second so many times, um, and like I think that there were a lot of people who were like, oh yeah, but she can't close. Like she's a good player, but she can't close. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously we all know that when you get heads up, it's like so random, you yeah. know. But uh, but so get, it was like just get the monkey off my back. Like okay, mm-hmm. fine, I have my bracelet now. <laughs> Screw mm-hmm. you. And I was thinking like last year they asked me like who who who's the best player who doesn't have a bracelet yet? And I said Eric Lindgren, but he closed it out finally as well. Right. John Jawanda for a long time was that guy. Like, there's always that there's person. There's a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, and I was that person for a long time. Like, people who thought they thought was a very good tournament player but had never managed to – always came in second. Well, but did you, did you ever think between 1994 and 2004, did you ever think it wasn't going to happen? Um, yeah. <laughs> I had so many seconds. Mm-hmm. You know, and the funny thing about a lot of those seconds was a lot of those seconds I got first place money. You know, where, like, there was a deal struck. Oh, right. You know, yeah. and and uh, I ended up getting more money, but I didn't actually get the hardware. It was really right. horrible. And I'll tell you what, I got heads up with someone one time. I won't say what event because I don't want to say who it was. Okay. Who offered to, like, take extra money but let me have the bracelet. And I wouldn't do that because I think that's cheating. Yeah. So I was like, no, we should go play. And we were we were both relatively even in chips. I had very slightly more. And I got into a spot where I had two pair, and all he had was an up and down draw with one to come. And all the money went in on the turn, and, he, and that's all he had with one to come. So he only had um, eight outs, and that was it. Well, I think a lot of people would have taken the deal, probably. I know. Well, know? I didn't. So anyway, so he hit the straight. And since we were very close in chips, that meant that I had just a tiny bit, and I obviously couldn't win it from there. And, you know, that was the one where he he literally said to me, like, I'll, I'll just take an extra, I think he wanted, like, an extra 15000 or something, and mm-hmm. le- he'd let me have the bracelet. And I just refused to do that. Mm-hmm. I was actually kind of, I was, like, mm-hmm. society was a little insulted that I was asked. But, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I'm not going to buy a bracelet. So, right. anyway. And I didn't regret it after I lost, but that was the one where I was, like, I could have a bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you followed up your first WSUP bracelet by winning the Invitational Only, um, the Tournament of Champions. Yeah. Right. So what was going right for you back then? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, with the Omaha, I had, I had gotten really deep in a lot of Omaha's, it, you know, a lot of times. Like, that's a game where I tend to get deep. So I think that things just, I got to that final table, and honestly, I just made so many wheels. Yeah. Crazy. I was just going nut, nut, every hand, nut, nut. I think a monkey could have played my cards and won that bracelet, which is really good. And the Tournament of Champions, um... You know, I went in there and I was like, look, these people are all really amazing. And mm-hmm. most of them are better than I am. So, uh, you know, I have to hope that things really go my way. And honestly, in that particular event, I think that everybody just felt like they had to go in and have things go their way. Yeah. You know, because there was nobody who was going to be giving away any chips there. Like, it just wasn't going to happen. So, you know, I got short really early in that. And then things just start going my way. And, and, and you know... I only had one really big suck out. I had six against my brother's sevens. Yeah. And I flopped a full house. But that was the only time that I really sucked out. The rest mm-hmm. of the time, the things going my way were just I'd have the best hand and it would hold up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that whoever was going to win that, it was just going to be that sequence where they just won the hands that they needed to win. So mm-hmm. I can't say that anything was going right that Perfect. day except that, yeah, I mean, it was just, yeah. it was my day, right. you know. It's time to talk about life before poker. You were born and raised in New Hampshire. Yep. What was life like in a letterer household? <laughs> life was really crazy in the letterer household. <laughs> I have a really insane family. Um, you know, mostly life was a lot of games. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my dad was a very competitive tennis player. And then we played lots and lots of cards. We didn't play poker, though. Um, but we played a lot of gin and oh hell and rummy and I was chess. Like, Chess. Well, my brother was mostly playing chess. Like, I'm a very bad chess player. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of Scrabble. Uh, you know, I'd sit and play cards with my mom at the kitchen table, like different games like Casino. Yeah. Um, we spent, like, a lot of our family interaction was over games. And not, like, board games. So my brother and I would play Risk and Monopoly and stuff like that. But with my parents, all of our interaction was card games. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I think that when people are like, oh, how, isn't it weird that you and your brother both became card players? It's like, no. not really. 
Yeah. You know, from the time I was little, there were cards in my hand. And mm -hmm. whether it's poker or not, you learn something about the way card games work, and they, they all have similarities. So that was mostly what it was, you know. And then, you know, it was like this weird, like a lot of word play. Because <laughs> my brother, is a, my, my father, rather, is um, a linguist. And so yeah. there was a lot of weird conversation over the dinner table. Mm -hmm. I, I think there was like we were a lot of like word stuff, talking a lot of history. Like we had very adult conversation in our family. It was weird. Well, we asked Howard the same question. We asked him, what was it like being the only boy in the family? And he right. said, never really thought about it. He's like, yeah, I don't think he would being have, the actually, oldest yeah. or being the oldest. He's like, meh, you yeah. know. But what was it like being the middle kid? Well, see, I wasn't really the middle kid because mm -hmm. my, my sister is seven years younger than I am. So you have my brother and I are 22 months apart, so I was actually the baby. Yeah. And then my sister came along, and, I, you know, she, she was seven years younger than me. So right. um, I really got to be the baby most of the time. Mm. So uh, I got away with a lot more stuff, I think, than my brother did. Well, you go <laughs> As on. babies do. You go on to attend Columbia University, where yep. you double major in English and psychology. But then you go to graduate school at UPenn. Yep. You left after five years? After, I was, this, I was like, literally, I had to go back and defend the dissertation. Yeah. It was all done. How tough was that decision? Um, it actually wasn't tough at all because I'll, I'll tell you what happened. So I was going to Columbia, and, uh, you know, I had gone to this very hoity-toity Eastern prep school called St. Paul School. My yeah. brother had gone there, too, because my father taught there, so it was free, oh. um, which is great. We got a great education. It's not a place that I would necessarily send my children because mm -hmm. it's a little too much for me. But, uh, but anyway, so then I went to Columbia, and it was like this big freedom for me because I had been in this sort of East Coast prep school you know, very stiff back like world, right. and then oh, boom, I'm in New York City. And so I spent most of my college, I mean, I got a really good GPA, but most of my time was spent going out to clubs. Yeah. And like really just sort of spreading my wings, like getting out of this whole idea that, you know, I mean, I came out of St. Paul's because of the place that that was, that like, in some ways you were your education. Like one of the first questions I'd ask people is like, where'd you go to school? Which is a ridiculous question to ask. It's not a question that I ask now. Right. But that was the world that I grew up in. So, you know, here, now all of a sudden I'm in New York and I'm like just discovering like there's all sorts of different people and they all have different things to bring and it doesn't matter where you went to school and like yeah. people are just cool. And I spent all my time like exploring my social life, mm -hmm. which was really great. And I mean, not that I didn't get a great education at Columbia, but I wasn't focused on like what's my professional life going to look like. Right. It was like this was all my social life because it was new for me. I think a lot of people do that in college. Yeah, so. I think so. You know, and it's a good. Th I think it's the right time for you to do that as long mm -hmm. as you're not letting your academics go to crap. You know, but so but the thing was that when, when I got done with college, like all of my friends, by the time they were a senior, they were doing like internships and all this stuff, yeah. and I still was like, oops. <laughs> so when it came time to be like, what am I supposed to do now? I was like. I'm a really good student. I have a really good GPA. I'm very good at being a student. And so mm -hmm. I got a National Science Foundation fellowship, which are they're very hard to come by. And I was like, okay, well, I'll, just, I'll go to college, you know, I'll go to yeah. graduate school. So I sort of say to people, like, I went to graduate school because I didn't make a choice, not because I made a choice to go, but it was just like I hadn't made any other choices in my life as far as that part of my life was concerned. So I then went to graduate school, and I'm really type A. And so once I was there, I was going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I did really well. I got great grades. I was giving talks around the country and all this stuff. And then now I'm going for job talks. And, you know, because you do that before you actually get your PhD. So I'm going for job talks, which are just job interviews in the academic world. And it was at that moment that I realized that I had never made a choice to do this. <laughs> like, this wasn't, I had just sort of like been in this stream and been carried down the stream mm -hmm. for lack of ever thinking about what I really wanted to do, which was really bad. And, Honestly, it was then I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this. Yeah. I don't want to be a professor. It's not what I want. So I decided to take some time off. So I delayed my job talks for a year. Okay. And during that year, I had just gotten married. I was living in Montana with my new husband. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any money because I obviously I didn't have my fellowship now. Sure. You know, even though my fellowship was $13,000 a year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And um, so I needed money, and so I called my brother up, and I was like, there's poker in Montana. Like, maybe I can do that right. um, just to survive for the next year while I'm sort of figuring out what I want to do before I go back and defend my dissertation and go back out for job talks after I've taken.